welcome to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey Podcast. I'm Lucia Kelly, expert at applied analysis and a good source of potassium. And I'm Talia Franks, media critic, fanfic enthusiast, and Marxism in action, or a West End musical. And we're here today to talk about The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances, the ninth and tenth episodes of series one of Doctor Who. The Empty Child aired on the 21st of April, 2005, and The Doctor Dances aired on the 28th of April, 2005. Both episodes were written by Stephen Moffat and directed by James Haas. Reminder that time isn't a straight line. It can twist into any shape, and as such, this is a fully spoiled podcast. We might bring things in from later in the show, the comics, the books, or even fan theories and articles. With that out of the way, I think we better initiate emergency protocol 417. Let's get in the TARDIS. A whole full series just on Nancy. I love Nancy so much. Just mwah. I want Nancy to get her own comic series, her own big finish, her yeah. own everything, her own everything. Her own everything. She's so, oh my God. She's the epitome of chef's kiss. <laughs> Just so, so good. So, so good. I just, my heart. So how do they know it's 30 seconds from the center of London? I think the doc's just giving a bit of a conservative estimate. Because, yeah, they're in the middle of the time stream. They're in the middle of the time stream. But also, how is it 30 seconds from the middle of London? Because that's a time and a distance. And that's not how that works. Yeah. I guess if the TARDIS is locked onto it, it can predict where it's going. So if this object stays at the same trajectory it looks like in about 30 seconds it will arrive in london at some point in time but, but they're in a time stream yeah yeah like giving me mad parsec vibes <laughs> <laughs> just saying mm. anyway i also gotta say they finally said it how long can you go around the universe without running into Earth? <laughs> and how long can you go around the universe without running into England? The fuck? A day. <laughs> A day. I will say we immediately jump into that very characteristic bantery dialogue style of Moffat's, which is banter on top of banter on top of banter. It's banter all the way down. Banter all the way down. I thought I was in a Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> honestly it's surprising that Moffat has not been hired by Marvel at some point please don't I'm shocked <laughs> yeah I'm not inviting that into the world any gods of prophecy don't knock me down don't at me it's <laughs> not a request also why doesn't the doctor know what year it is why doesn't he just check the console because this is more fun when has the doctor ever checked the console ever in their lives on purpose. He doesn't want to do a scan for alien tech either. No, that would be too easy. Because it's what the plot wanted. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but also, in terms of making it work within character, like figuring out an in-world reason. This is setting up Captain Jack. This is the beginning of setting up the dynamic and how, for the purposes of this episode, Captain Jack and the Doctor are, there's a bit of narrative foil between them. They're deliberately set up against each other. Yeah. And I got to say also, this episode introduces a lot of Moffat's tricks. We've noted before that Moffat tends to repeat some of his old favorites in later seasons, including a creepy small child who calls a phone that they shouldn't be able to reach. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, it happens again in season six. And also, the base of a lot of Moffat's Monsters of the Week tend to be, let's take this innocuous thing that you see every day and make it super creepy. So in this case, in a long line of horror tradition, we're making the creepy child. Also, the child that you 
care for and want the best for and immediately emotionally attached to. The minute that dialogue starts, the minute the little question of, are you my mommy, comes out, I'm immediately bawling. I'm immediately in tears. I'm so concerned about this child. I'm just freaked out. I literally can't hear the phrase, are you my mummy, without shivers. Actually, the moment where I actually start caring about the child is the moment when it's trying to get through the door. That's when I actually start caring about the child. Before then, it's just the child is ominous. But when it's trying to get through the door and the doctor is talking and goes to open the door and then the child's gone, that's when I start to care. Okay, so let's talk about Rose's core strength. Because really utilizing that gymnastics award is all I'm saying. She's got a history now of grabbing onto ropes. She also- does. <laughs> she has so much core strength. She must work out every I'm so confused. Day. <laughs> There's a gym room specifically for her <laughs> in the TARDIS. But also, okay, so she goes after this child. She grabs onto the rope. She literally looks up. Did she not see that it's attached to a giant limb? I have no idea. Rose is so smart and yet so not. So we're going to leave Rose hanging, quite literally. Also, the doctor, I feel so bad for him. Everyone's <laughs> laughing at him. If I was in that bar and I had come for a drink, the way he does it, the way the whole thing is set up is very much impromptu comedy hour. <laughs> it is. <laughs> To the point where I would have thought it was a joke. I would have thought this is a new comedian on the scene, trying new material. I would have been looking a bit to the bouncer being like, is he meant to be up there? (laughs) I would have thought, oh, the singer just finished and it's a new act and it's a comedy guy. (laughs) Yeah. Also, can we talk about that lighting? The lighting in these two episodes, the way that the camera is framed, there are some absolutely gorgeous shots. The opening shot from behind the singer as light floods in and you see her silhouette. Beautiful work. These episodes are definitely getting a five out of five for direction. Maybe a four out of five because there are some questionable choices, but by far one of the best directed episodes. Tell me more. It was very much in the same vein of the unquiet dead moment that I had issues with where what was shot and the text didn't quite match up in a way that frustrated me (laughs) so Rose looking up and seeing but not seeing the balloon is one of them and there were a few other moments where it was just like I can't think of them in the moment but they were there (laughs) okay if we're gonna talk about things that frustrated us I gotta say The fact that Nancy, wonderful Nancy, queen of my heart, decides to blackmail Mr. What's-His-Face because of his gay relationship. Yeah, there are some really, which I mean, should we expect anything less from Moffat, but there is some questionable kind of opposing ideologies about LGBT people in these two episodes so you've got captain jack who is living his flirtatious audacious extrovert flirty by life living his best life actually yeah they say (laughs) i think they don't actually use that phrase in this episode but i know that Mm. described in other places yeah definitely the kind of guy that i love to watch on screen that i would absolutely hate to be in the same room with Oh, definitely. (laughs) I appreciate him as a character, adore him as a character. I would hate him on (laughs) site. Yeah, it's on site. So we've got wonderful Captain Jack. And then there's the scene you're talking about where Nancy blackmails this. Also, getting fat phobia vibes as well from that whole... That whole little family is very much look at these fat, ugly people and how they store food and how they're not working towards. Yep. And then there's the moment in The Doctor Dances where Rose makes this comment, like, other words, distract the guard going my way. 
And then Jack very calmly just sort of like, well, you're not his type. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very cool about it, very cute about it. And like goes off and is like, I'm going to distract the guard. Like genuinely looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, because he and that and guard then, have a thing. Yeah. Like they're an established, then, they're, they're friends with benefits and that's their thing. And I'm cool with it. Yeah. And then Rose and the doctor have this really interesting conversation. <laughs> Which is just, it's Rose versus biphobia. And it's not great. It's really not great. I don't like that for Rose. I don't know whether I'm just romanticizing Rose, but given everything we know about her, it also doesn't really feel in character. It doesn't. One of her big traits is her compassion and empathy. Like, that's Rose. So it doesn't make sense to me that Rose would be homophobic. Yeah, but then they also threw that you're so gay line in. Episode. That is true. That uh, is true. Maybe I am romanticizing Rose. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe everyone in 2005 was homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> also a possibility. But yeah, it's not great. It's not a good time. But we move on from it pretty quick. Also, I feel like that scene was there specifically to show that point of view, which doesn't need to be shown as well. There's a way to have that conversation without casting any kind of moral judgment on Jack. Mm -hmm. And that's not what happens. And I don't like it. Yeah, I also don't like that the introduction to Jack and having a character like Jack who is so open and expressive and out and unapologetic about himself is as a criminal. Also that his opening line is sexualizing Rose. Yeah. His opening line is excellent bottom. And then we have that whole back and forth. So our introduction to Jack is as sexually promiscuous person who is attracted to multiple genders, which is a really problematic trope that is often, because people run into the problem of like, okay, how do I show that this person is attracted to people who present multiple different ways? And the only way, because they put two seconds of thought into it, like, oh, well, I'll just make them promiscuous. And there's nothing wrong with being promiscuous. Exactly. And I love to see all kinds of characters out there. So I don't think there's anything wrong with having a promiscuous character. The problem is that when it's the only representation of the character and when that character is someone who's not just promiscuous but objectifies other people in their being promiscuous because as you said that's jack's opening line rather than being like oh i should save this person or even like that's interesting or something being like huh there's a girl floating 600 feet above london with a union jack slashed across the chest i feel like that's the more eye-catching part of Mm. what's happening right there (laughs) It's a weird, I was going to say it's a weird introduction for Jack. It's not, it's just not, Jack becomes so much more than that. And right now he's very much a sort of, they haven't colored him in yet. They haven't filled in all of the nuances that Jack will later have. So right now he's just slutty by con man in brackets, American. This early Jack is so much different from who he becomes later on. Yeah. For one thing, he's not a giant disembodied head in a jar. (laughs) 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 But that's a whole other issue. That's a whole other issue. I've got more problems with... Okay, so... Jack rescues Rose. She gets brought in. I do like the fact that, as opposed to The Unquiet Dead, Rose is knocked unconscious again in the presence of a man. This one doesn't violate her. Yay! Yay! I hate hate that that's the bar we have to jump over. 
but there it is he just puts her in a bed and lets her wake up on her own no zombies yay <laughs> yay <laughs> it's the really low bar but this psychic paper interaction so they have this back and forth with the psychic paper and apparently and i think we can trust jack on this one because he mentions mickey's full name so clearly it says something about mickey apparently rose has a boyfriend but she's very available rose what the fuck the levels of my internal screaming are unmatched unmatched i am just it doesn't sit right with my spirit my heart clenches. Like you say that Rose is an empathetic person, but she's a... I will say it's a very specific kind of empathy. And I think I might have talked about this before, but Rose really likes to be the one saving people. She has a savior complex. Yeah. So she will be on the lookout for victims she can save but she's not gonna she's also a flighty bitch she, a little bit yeah she doesn't do a lot of internal reflection or sort of doesn't really think about how she affects the people she's close to we see that with jackie we see that with mickey we also see that with the doctor a bit as their relationship develops. Mm -hmm. You don't say. She's an interesting one, that Rose Tyler. She's selfish and she's petty and I don't like her. Yeah. She is all of those things. That's definitely a part of her personality. But let's not talk about Rose. Let's talk about Nancy, queen of my heart. Oh my God, I love her so much. <laughs> Nancy be the companion? Can we just replace her? Like, Let's bring Nancy and her little boy Jamie onto the TARDIS. Let's not leave them in World War II. Yeah, <laughs> let's not do that. She's... Mm, I was going to say she's doing alright for herself. She, she's not doing great, but I don't know. The way that she uses her power... So we've got this woman, single mom in 1940, young mom as well like would have been a teenager when she had jamie is probably only in her early 20s now if that and the way that she has just completely taken the life that has been given to her in both hands and said you know what i may have been dealt a shitty hand that doesn't mean that i have a shitty life the way she takes all these kids under her wing, the way that she, I hate the fact that she uses this man's sexuality against him. I love the fact that she takes control of the situation. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of parallels between her and the doctor. The moment when they're observing the train station mm -hmm. and they're having this whole conversation and she thinks it's over and then he asks, who did you lose? And the way that both the doctor and Nancy react to intense personal loss, they turn that grief and they turn that pain into compassion for others and helping others is really admirable. Yeah. And the other moment that really strikes me as a moment of connection between the doctor and Nancy is when they're all sitting around the table and eating and all the kids are there and they're passing the plate around and none of the kids notice the doctor, but it's obvious mm. that he knew he was there. Oh yeah. None of the kids noticed him until he mm. said, thanks miss. None of the kids mm. noticed him, but she knew he was there. Oh yeah. She spotted him the second he walked in, but she was chill with him. She was happy to let him share a meal with them until he started scaring the other kid. <laughs> and then she was like okay well now you gotta go well also started getting dangerously close to the truth like she's cool with you as long as you don't question her motives or her past mm -hmm. and then you get very quickly dismissed 
Yep. Which we appreciate a woman with boundaries. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, no, because he was getting close to the truth and he was freaking out the children. And that's not something that she could abide. (laughs) Not at this table. I will say another part of their conversation at the train station, the doctor's framing of England's position in World War II is so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting. It's a, it's a, that's a, that's a hell of a reframing there. It's a, it's a take. <laughs> sure is. Pretty sure it was more empire against empire. There's no, there's nothing. Tiny little island? Hmm. Tiny little island. One way to look at England. One way to look at England. <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened to the sun never sets on the English Empire? <laughs> mm. What about that? What about that thing you just said? But back to nine yeah. in that whole scene where he says, not sure if it's Marxism in action or West End musical. First of all, I like that line. But also she says, I suppose you would know. And then he's like, I do actually. Mm -hmm. And I wrote those two quotes down. And then I wrote down, Nine's curiosity and compassion makes me want to cry. And I think I actually was tearing up at that scene. Yeah. Oh my God. The way that Jamie is framed from jump. From jump. And the uses of the phones and controlling the media and this tiny little request and oh it breaks my heart so much and the way that Christopher Eccleston plays off that Mm -hmm. and just shows so many different layers at once Mm -hmm. the way that he like Nancy is clearly terrified of this child. The rest of the children are terrified of this child. And the way that he sees that, acknowledges that, and still chooses to be kind, Mm -hmm. it's just my heart. Yeah. And I think also the kindness that he shows the doctor that he meets in the hospital. Yeah. Which, oh. Oh, that hospital is Albion Hospital, which mm-hmm. is the same hospital from Aliens of London and World War Three, where, yeah, where they took that pig that's not an alien. So it's the same hospital. But yeah, so, can I just say, the sonic screwdriver is a magic wand. It is. We just got to accept that at this point. It can diagnose people and... Yeah, if you took a, if you took a screwdriver to someone's head... <laughs> I'm not sure it would give you. And then Jack is like, well, what can it do? And then the doctor's like, it's Sonic. And I'm just like, what can it do? What, like... You literally just used it as a medical diagnostic tool. You're going to use it to reconstitute barbed wire? What even is protocol 417? How does Rose know how to use this? It only has two buttons. Yeah, how do you... Is it like a psychic link? Do you have to do a little Morse code combo? to get it to the right setting? Do you have to calibrate it? I've got to say, the physical effect, every time they transform into the gas mask creatures, it's so well done. It's so creepy. It's so well done and so disturbing at the same time. The terror in their faces when they see what they're about to become. Mm Mm-hmm. The way he has tears in his eyes when the only thing he can say is, are you my mummy? He knows he's losing his autonomy. And the way that he looks at his hand and he knows that he's going to transform, but he doesn't say anything because he wants to. Oh, Richard Wilson, (laughs) A plus. (laughs) Like the acting is going to save the day once again. Like. Before this began, I was a father and a grandfather, and now I am neither. Like, gut punch. And the doctor says, I know the feeling. Yeah, and I just, like, oh, I am devastated. But the thing is, interspersed with the doctor and Nancy and all this emotion and heaviness is... Rose and Jack being campy as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh, Jack, what are you doing? When you go in the second time and you know that Jack is playing her, he's being so transparent about it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, but Rose totally clocks it. Do you reckon? Yeah, no. I don't think she does. Not, not at first. Because Rose, does Rose normally let strange men tie her up is my question. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> no, I mean. but so let me pull up the transcript here. So there's this point where Rose and Jack, they're on uneven footing. I feel like Jack mm. is very much playing Rose right up until Rose says, you know, it's getting a bit late. I should really be getting back. Jack says, we're discussing business. And then Rose says, on a spaceship during a German air raid, do you really think now is a good time to be coming on to me? That's the point at which I think things switch over. I think Rose, either at that point or maybe a little bit before, kind of figures out what's going on. Because... I... She acts real shocked when Jack comes clean is the thing she does not act shocked you really think she's shocked when jack comes clean about being a con man i think you need to watch that scene again i think that she's outraged and upset that everything at the fact that he's a con man and that everything that he did was I don't think that she clocked on to the fact that it wasn't really a warship. I don't think she predicted that it was actually an ambulance. But I do think that she clocked on to the fact that he wasn't authentic. Mm. The way that she says the delivery of the line when Jack clocks that they're not actually time agents. The bitterness and the spitting of just a couple more freelancers feels personal in a way that I read as she had only just fully realized what was going on. Really? I read it the complete opposite. Interesting. I read just a couple more freelancers as sort of smirking, like we were playing you just as much as you were playing us. I don't know. I think we read it completely differently. <laughs> yeah, no, we have to watch. That's fine. I love the fact that we have completely different takes on the scene. That's exactly the kind of thing that proves how subjective analysis is. It's just interesting that we read it completely differently. Okay, so the empty child ends, the doctor dances begins. The fact that the doctor solves this problem. <laughs> <laughs> I love how the doctor solves this problem. <laughs> By sending them to their room with the authority that has been honed by telling multiple toddlers the same thing. <laughs> he is speaking as a parent. That tone comes from experience. Mm -hmm. That child actor, stunning work. The little head tilt, my heart. It's not his fault. It's but not his fault. The creepiness of I'm here. <laughs> when but, <that's> because... Okay. <laughs> no one is answering this kid's question. No one is acknowledging what he, he has one question. He has one question and no one acknowledges it. I'm not talking about answering it. Except for I'm the talking doctor. about acknowledging it. Except for the doctor. Except for the doctor. But in that interview, we hear Constantine questioning the kid. And no acknowledgement of, like, clearly this kid has an objective. Mm -hmm. Clearly you're not going to get any answers out of him. If we're thinking about it from step one, if you just came across this child and you're trying to figure out what happened to them, right? Immediately, as soon as you try to start asking all the questions like, where are you? What information can you give us about where you're from, what your name is? And the only thing that kid is asking is, are you my mummy? Where's my mummy? You acknowledge that child. You switch beats. Those questions are not going to be answered. Switch beats. Acknowledge the child. I'm so upset. <laughs> yeah, except no one acknowledges children because children don't matter. Obviously, I don't think this, but this is what adults think. Especially in the 1940s. <laughs> yeah. 
It's just heartbreaking. And then the room <laughs> flooded with children's drawings as the full impact of the depth of distress that is clear that this child is experiencing. It's an awful episode. I love it. What is wrong with you? I don't know. I don't know what it is. These two episodes, it's the same with Father's Day, right? The episodes that upset me the most tend to be my favorite. I don't know why. I have no answers. So we go from this deeply distressing scene to a little bit of camp banter with the whole banana situation. So they escape to this room. And this happens a few times. The doctor slut shames Rose mercilessly in a way that I think we're meant to read as jealousy. But honestly, not a good look on him. And to be fair, we've just come off Adam. I would be a bit tetchy too about bringing any new boys in the TARDIS if Adam had just happened. But he says, where'd you pick this one up? And I really appreciate the fact that Jack immediately reframes the blame to himself. Like immediately just steps in. So the doctor says, where'd you pick this one up? And he just steps in and says, she was hanging from a barrage balloon. I had an invisible spaceship. I never stood a chance. He makes it all about him in a way that takes the spotlight away from Rose. And there's a bit of judgment in the way he delivers that line, being like, oi, stop that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the Jack that I know. Yeah. Fun, campy, flirty Jack is delightful and always a fun time but the jack that i actually truly love is that jack which is almost immediately undercut by the fact that he vanishes all by himself yeah <laughs> that i was gonna say that's a little bit undercut which is unfortunate but, but also rose my girl my darling please raise your standards she says he saved my life that's up there with flossing <laughs> my, dear. <laughs> no. my darling dear does mickey floss this is now in question no we know he rinses rather than washes dishes are we about to take no. away mickey's one hygiene point <laughs> you're making me sad <laughs> It's just, it's just upsetting. It's so upsetting. Also, can we talk about how creepy this child is? Yeah, the way that <laughs> the script and the direction work together to build that tension, just build it and build it and build it to make this child simultaneously as menacing and also somehow compelling and empathy drawing as possible is insane mm -hmm. and also this demonstrates that the child can say things other than are you my mummy but that <laughs> question is so all-encompassing and so pervasive and such a motivation driver that's all he wants to say We've also got to acknowledge that a large proportion of his brain is gone. There's a lot of magic science in this episode, yeah. which I think actually works out. I think they do a really good job of explaining what needs to be explained. We see inside the mask a few times and you see the back, like the leather of it. It's the empty child. There is no child there. And I think mainly that's just because rendering half a skull would have been traumatizing and expensive. <laughs> yeah. But we're made to understand that the core essence, the spirit of the child is what's present. Mm hmm Which again, comes back, acknowledge the kid's question, then he can talk to you. <laughs> yep. Which leads us very neatly into possibly the most emotional scene ever the bomb is coming down and everyone is stressed we have that gorgeous moment just before between rose and nancy 
where which is a reoccurring trope within Doctor Who of giving people living in the present slight spoilers about the future mm-hmm. or answering questions that they have with famous people it tends to be like does my work live beyond me like the doctor's not about to give out the lotto numbers he gives donna a winning lottery ticket i'm just saying that is true i have to take that back he does in <laughs> fact give someone the lotto numbers <laughs> um the, the little moment between rose and nancy is very sweet and i love the fact that she's like yeah i believe you're a time traveler i don't for a second believe you're from the future <laughs> Yeah, no, she says, like, I believe you're a time traveler, but I don't believe that there's a future. (laughs) (laughs) But also, I just love so much the moment when the doctor realizes that Nancy is Jamie's mother because Nancy is, like, not the child, Jamie. Yeah, that's when he clocks it. That's when he clocks it. And then there I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. When she's kneeling with him and we're finally getting that resolution, the child's question is being answered and we get the gutting aside from the doctor being like, there's not enough left of him. This question is so all-consuming that he can't even hear the answer. Mm -hmm. And so the actress's name is Florence Hoth. By God, what a performance. <laughs> I'm, li- I'm tearing up thinking about it. It's so moving. It's so beautiful. And to see her journey from this incredibly tough, but like that toughness is brittle. It's not solid because underneath, and you see that throughout the whole thing, is that Nancy is constantly haunted by the belief that how she treated the whole Jamie situation was wrong. Like the fact that she felt she couldn't tell him that she was his mother, the fact that he died under her watch, the whole Jamie situation is just racking her with guilt. And the final resolution of that as she stands in the truth and hugs him and all the gold is everywhere. I'm going to (laughs) cry. Oh, we should wrap this up. Everybody Everybody lives. Everybody lives. But not everybody, because guess what? Jack's in trouble. (laughs) Guess what? Jack's in trouble. Except the doctor knows how to dance. So... They land the TARDIS on his ship, but he has to come in quick. Which draft? <laughs> questions. We know how big the TARDIS is. Every time I watch that scene, I'm pulled out by the fact that the TARDIS would not fit in that ship. In that tiny little cock bay? Except. No way. Except the TARDIS can be smaller on the outside. But then how does Jack fit in? He crouches. Does he? I don't think he does. He does. I remember him ducking in. Okay. I'm All pretty right. sure I remember him ducking in. All right. <laughs> you can rewatch the scene if you don't believe me, but I think I remember him ducking in. <laughs> but yeah, thus the thruple is born, right? I don't think I've ever seen anything the more th- poly than that last scene. I have never seen it. The dynamic that's established. Beautiful. Perfect. (laughs) Nine Rose Jack is my OT3. (laughs) Just beautiful. Chemistry between all of them. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else? that happened in these two episodes that you want to talk about before we get into uh, the wrap-up? I just want to firmly establish dancing is a metaphor for sex. I don't feel like we said it explicitly yet, but dancing Mm. equals sex. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In case that wasn't clear. (laughs) In case that wasn't abundantly clear. I mean, I guess we've really got to acknowledge now they are 100% pushing Rose and the Doctor as a couple. Mm-hmm. 
that is a thing that is definitely happening and while they- simultaneously not being acknowledged it's very odd like all that needed to happen was mickey needed to be a best friend that's that- all that needed to happen all that needed to happen why is he a boyfriend doesn't make sense anyway because heterosexism I want to double down on my assertion that Nancy deserves her own comic series, and I want to see it. I want to read it. I want to see Jamie older. Yep. I want Jamie's adventures. I want Nancy established in her power. Mm -hmm. And I want to see Jamie as a young 20-something in the 60s. Yes! Yes! oh my goodness uh, oh my goodness especially because that moment when the doctor like he is to pop music you're gonna love it <laughs> yeah and he picks up jamie and he spins him around and it's just like the cutest thing also that jamie he's so cute he's, he's so, so adorable cute. he's oh so God. adorable that sweet um, little face <laughs> but can we just point out that actor is probably at least 20 years old now exactly perfect time to bring back a mini series about Nancy and Jamie in the yeah. 60s. Perfect timing. So yes. bring them back. Okay. What was your least favorite moment of the episode? When Nancy uses what's his name sexuality against him. That was really gross. Yeah. Tied with Rose saying how flexible because biphobia is gross. Yeah, no. My least favorite moment was the biphobia moment. Hate that. Hate that for Rose. Hate that for everyone involved. She seems to get over it pretty oh, quickly. Um, also, the very available. Yeah, some real low points. The low points. Favorite moment, though. Everybody lives. That's obviously the best moment. The everybody lives and the yes, I'm your mummy. But those two moments are so close together, I feel like they're one moment. (laughs) One all-encompassing, highly emotional moment. (laughs) That whole scene, it grinds my heart into a pulp and then just spreads it all out into my chest until I feel whole again. (laughs) Hero? Nancy. 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 100%. Nancy. 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 Adam. Was there an Adam this episode? The closest I can think of is Rose for the biphobia moment, but like everyone's pretty solid. I think if there is an Adam, I would say that Jack is the Adam for the empty child only. (laughs) Because at that point, not the Adam for the doctor dances, but Jack is the Adam for the empty child. He is the worst, isn't he? <laughs> Jack he gets away Adam with it. Child. He gets away with it because he's charming, but he is the Adam. <laughs> yeah, Jack gets away with it because he's charming, but he is the Adam. Yeah. All right. <laughs> he does set this whole thing in motion. Which, which at least he acknowledges in the end. He gets redeemed, but he is, in fact, the Adam. <laughs> yeah. But there's a long period of like, well, I didn't do anything wrong. And the whole volcano day comment, that's like, <laughs> wow. But I feel like this is a five out of five for everything. Is there any point where it's like, no, it's five out, this of, is, out of five. It's five out of five. This episode gets 100%. 100%. A plus. A plus. <laughs> <laughs> This is the first set of episodes where they really knocked it out of the park. Just completely. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Anyway, come back next time where we talk about Boomtown, one of the most underrated episodes of Doctor Who ever. No one talks about Boomtown. Boomtown is the best. Boomtown is my go-to episode when I need an uplift, when I need to watch a feel good episode when i need to just lose myself in doctor who i watch boomtown i love boomtown it's my favorite it's a classic it is a classic every season has an episode where i can just go to it and just lose myself in doctor who Mm -hmm. and and boomtown is my go-to episode 
And with that ringing endorsement, we shall leave you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> this has been the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this adventure with us through space and time. You can find us elsewhere on the internet on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram as at WibblyPod. Follow us for more Wibbly Wobbly content. You can find out more information about us and our content on wibblywobblytimeywimey.net and full transcripts for episodes at wibblywobblytimeywimey.net slash transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send us an email at wibblywobblytimeywimeypod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and other platforms as it helps other people find us and our content. Special thanks to our editor, Owen Elphick, who has been a vital member of the Wibbly Wobbly team. That's all for now. Catch you in the time vortex.